This is a production of Cornell University. Thank you much, Paul. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be in person speaking to uh, you all. Which, uh, I've been locked on Zoom for a lot of the time, but this is nice. So when I was asked to do this talk, I thought about how, how to kind of think about uh, presenting a lot of my work. And I thought I could either kind of zoom in on zoom in on one particular project like we would typically do for a seminar, or I can give you a long vision of what we've done over 42 years. And uh, so I thought I'd do the latter, which took me a while to pare it down to make a reasonable story. And so that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna to try to tell you what has been the objectives and the impetus and the projects that the Urban Horticulture Institute, which I started in 1980, um, has been doing for the last 40 years. More and more, we're recognizing that trees and urban vegetation have tremendous ecological and uh, environmental benefits for cities. We're getting more and more press about this. And in terms of the ecosystem benefits that these uh, vegetation provide for people is, is quite significant in terms of stormwater reduction, air and water quality, energy conservation, cooling, carbon sequestration, urban heat island mitigation, habitat for pollinators, wildlife, and many more. But these are being recognized and quantified in many cases. Um, so in fact, uh, come late uh, April this year, into for about two or three weeks, you'll see these tags on trees in the Ag Quad. And you may have seen them before. We've done them for five years or so, which is quantifying the environmental and economic benefits that can be quantified for uh, stormwater, for air quality, for atmospheric carbon sequestration, uh, cooling, and so on. And we can quantify that and we can do it over some number of years and give the tree an a numerical a dollar value in terms of what it's doing for the environment. Of course, there are many more values to uh, trees than just the ones we can quantify monetarily. But it does help when you're trying to make the case, especially to legislators and planning departments that, you know, these trees will pay you back and they're not actually a cost. So we'll be doing that on a tree by tree basis. And you'll see that this program that we work on was from the uh, Forest Service, and we it's called small i, big T-R-E-E, -E, I tree. So we work on that program to quantify this. Um, but on a large scale, uh, trees and vegetation lower surface and air temperatures. Shaded surface may be you know, 20 to 45 degrees uh, cooler than, the, uh, than unshaded materials. New York City was receiving $5.60 of benefits for every $1 it spent to plant and maintain trees. And based on this cost analysis, Mayor Bloomberg uh, decided New York should substantially increase its urban forest. He started the Million Trees Project, which was supposed to be finished in 2017. It was actually finished in 2016. 223. 220,000 street trees and many more trees in other public spaces and private spaces were put in. But after three years, 30% of the street trees died or were missing. Missing, where did they go? Um, and a new tree planting initiative has been proposed by the new mayor, Eric Adams. So we always love to plant trees. You know, it's great, rah, rah, let's plant trees. But we don't want to have 30% or more missing after we do the the nice thing about planting trees. So a lot of what I'm talking about will be keeping those trees going. So there's another large scale issue about trees, which is the, the legacy of redlining. If you're not familiar with redlining, it's lower income and racial and ethnic minorities were denied loans and forced to live in crowded and poor quality housing with little investment in infrastructure. This started in the early 20th century and was outlawed about 50 years ago. But the legacy of that, uh, which you can see in Los Angeles here, this is a red line community with wider streets, fewer places for trees, poorer housing, more crowded housing. And in the wealthier areas of Los Angeles, you see 
a lot of tree uh, value there, a lot of uh, cooling, shading. And so this is a, in the legacy of that practice, which has now been outlawed for 50 years, still lives on in our cities. And it's not just Los Angeles, it's, it's everywhere, every big cities. So denied loans had to live in more crowded and multifamily housing and very little in, uh, infrastructure investment. So that's some of the, the things we need to think about because the urban environment is complicated. We want trees. We want to have these benefits. And more and more, we're recognizing that the benefits do exist. But having to create the spaces and the trees to actually have this happen is a complicated process. So um, because the urban environment is so complicated, I sort of had to hang my hat on some basic objectives for where we're going to spend our time, our, our graduate students' efforts uh, over the many years. And so I came to hang my hat on this process, which is a landscape establishment, which starts with site assessment. What do you got? Where are you? What in terms of your soil like, in terms of what the conditions are like? And then what's the proper plant for that site? Now, this used to be the big uh, right plant in the right place, and that's where it would stop. But we recognize that the site itself may be so, modern, so limiting that you can't just plonk a tree in there and hope for it's going to live. So site modification feeds into plant selection. The better the site, the more chance, more uh, diversity of plants you can do. And we also talked about nursery production, propagation, breeding, evaluation, all that goes into plant selection. And then finally, transplanting, getting the tree off to a good start for the first couple of years. That's what I felt we should really emphasize our work on because that's where most of the problems existed. We can plant trees, walk away, and very often 30% are missing three years later. So site assessment, we're gonna go understand the site opportunities and limitations. We live in a place where there's development, where there's building, even on the Cornell campus, uh, amazing amount of construction goes on, which has an effect on the soil. And so we need to understand that, especially soil is a big issue. Um, and if we look at the big picture, here's New York State showing the USDA hardiness zones. If you're not familiar, that's the average minimum winter temperature over a 30 year period, but this was an old one, but it has good colors. But you see New York is very varied. We have the, uh, the tundra up at the Adirondacks uh, into the, the tropics of Long Island. Because there are big bodies of water and our topography, we have very varied. So the average minimum winter temperature, how cold does it get in the winter? And you need to know that if you're gonna be choosing plants, they're gonna obviously wanna make it through to the next season. But what's interesting in terms of what's happening with this is that um, this is a this is a 25 year average of winter temperatures over the United States, and where it's where it's beige here, you can see basically that's the same. It's been the same for many years. Where it's pink is where things have gotten warmer in the winter. So here we are in New York State, and where we are, our winter temperatures have gotten warmer by one zone, which could be 10 degrees warmer of our average minimum winter temperature. So you need to know most of the country, the winter temperatures are getting warmer. And that has an effect on what trees you plant, what uh, other things in terms of uh, pollinators and so on. So that's the sort of big picture. And, but we want to get to the microclimate. I often say that uh, we've had climate change in the urban environment from before the word climate change was uh, on everybody's lips because of the microclimates we find in our cities. Reflected, re -re reflected heat, uh, increases temperature, decreases humidity, increases water stress. And we often talk about the urban heat island. This happens in Fresno, California, where you see uh, the hours of the day and temperature and the red line is the urban core of Fresno there. You can see it's after midday, you get much higher spike in the urban core temperature, which continues on into the evening. And uh, actually, if I can digress for a minute, uh, Don Rakow here, who was my graduate student in 1983, 
um, or so we're, um, we did a project in New York City streets uh, on Columbus Avenue and we would take temperatures and tree data with Tom Whitlow for, for 24 hours. We, I take a, the night shift and Tom would do the day shift and we have our parameters and light cores out there and we would take on all kinds of data. And uh, it was warm at night. I mean, so we were taking situations where we had lots more heat and uh, stress on the trees through the nighttime. We'll tell you a story about that another time. <laughs> Many stories. Yeah. So I love this infrared camera picture, which shows the heat of the surface with a camera. And so you can kind of zoom in on that, that those vertical elements there. Those are trees, right? And here's the, the temperature scale. So anywhere from 67 to 105 Fahrenheit. Under the trees, you have dark blue. 67 degrees, what's that? Shade. Shade. You know, I don't have to have to zoom now so I can say, what's that? And you can all say, shade. And then here in the, it's a park, in the outside of the shade, you have grass. And you're basically 82 degrees there on the surface of the grass. And what do you think this thing is here, this orange? <laughs> Concrete, asphalt, paving, right? and it's 105 degrees. And you think about all the paving, all the streets, all the cars, all the reflected buildings, that increases our urban heat island significantly. I like, this is a Sacramento, California. Uh, you see these little lollipops here? Um, so there, were, there are ordinances in many cities to require shade on a, a parking lot. 10%, 20%. And they put them in with the big pictures saying, oh, this is, tree's gonna get this big, it's gonna look great, and it's gonna shade all the cars. But those trees never got any bigger than what they looked like. There's reasons for that. Uh, but in, basically what they were dealing with, the impervious surfaces is estimated at 40,000 square miles, with about 316 added annually. And that's probably an underestimate because that was data taken a few years ago. So this is a big issue that we have to deal with. But in terms of above ground uh, site assessment, that's one thing, below ground is much more significant and something we can do something about. So dealing with the soil, uh, and you might recognize this place. Anybody recognize this? Yeah. What is it? Man Library. Yeah, that's yeah. It's, like, it's actually, it's a whole ag quad yeah. when it was being re re renovated. And you know, we had cars, we had trucks, we had materials just everywhere, which changes the soil, particularly compacting the soil, which then when they pull out, we have the legacy of that to deal with. Uh, so we measure that with penetrometers, with field, looking at the density of soil, and we'll also be taking bulk density, which is a very important measure of how tight the soil is to allow or not allow roots to get into it. Bulk density is a big issue that we deal with all the time. And then when you have dense soil, and this is Wegmans parking lot, uh, when they were doing some work, I got in there after a rainstorm and the water was just sitting there. It's our bathtub, no drainage, no porosity. So in fact, when we plant a nice red oak, you wonder why is it dying? because his roots are sitting in water and red oaks don't like the roots. And now you could have changed those species and had a tree that would deal with that, but no one really recognized the, the pros and cons of this. And of course, we also have issues of nutrition, uh, particularly higher pH in urban areas because of the building materials that leach into the soil. And we have chlorosis, iron chlorosis here with oaks, as you see here which is a common thing. And, you know, sometimes within 15 feet, you can have a tree that does well and the one that's doing poorly. And you think, what is going on because of all these different microclimate effects and soil effects, trees can do very, very differently within a very short space. And so if the trees could talk, <laughs> what would they say? <laughs> So, okay, so how do we deal with this? 
So we have genetic potential of a tree and the environmental reality, nature, nurture, okay? We have to deal with both of those things. We have to choose the right tree. We have to understand the environment and modify it if we can to make it better for trees to grow. The better we match up that, the better results are gonna be. So let's talk about plant selection a little bit because oh, it's a part that everybody loves. Oh, trees are beautiful. Um, so after many, many years, there are basically four criteria I think of, I use for selecting trees. And they're not necessarily hierarchical. You can start any place in this. First, we need pest-resistant plants adapted to environmental conditions. That's abiotic conditions. We need to have highly diverse native and non-native non-invasive trees. If we want to talk about natives versus non-natives, that's another talk, another time. Uh, it meets design and functional objectives. What do you want to do? Street trees, screens, uh, forest, whatever you want to do in terms of why you're planting the tree. And it has to match management limitations. What needs to be done? Can you get it? Can you find it? Is it a big size? Does it have pruning necessary? What kinds of things do you need to do? And can you provide that service to the trees? So these four factors are very important. And people who will always ask me, what's the perfect tree for, what's the best tree? You know, you're, you studied this for a long time. What's the best tree in my city? I said, well, we knew what the best tree was. 1930s, there's the, the clock tower. This is, of course, close to traffic. That's the American elm, Olmus Americana, which was planted all over uh, the Northeast, Midwest, because it was an incredibly tough tree, easy to transplant. It's wet and dry, it's floodplain species high up in the soil, no problem. It just, and it grew fast and it was beautiful and it created these arches that were famous. Uh, but then because of lack of diversity, same clock tower, uh, 1950s, I don't know if you know the car, probably the cars will tell you, um, all those gone. And they were all over the Cornell campus. In fact, I was an undergraduate in um, uh, 1971 to 74. And when I left in 74, there were still a couple of elms on the ag plot, but they were on the way out. So no more elms. And we have a really flat learning curve, really flat. So here's that same clock tower. And now we have one species, one cultivar in that portion of campus. Now, and they look great. Uh, but what happens if some particular insect or disease says, I like London Plains, uh, this would be a disaster. So diversity is key. And uh, if we look at New York State, we have 4.2 million street trees in New York State, giving us $560 million in benefits, quantifiable benefits. But 60% of the street trees are from four genera, maples, <laughs> Uh, I start 44%, 7% for oaks, 5% for honey locusts, and 4% for lindens. Four genera making up 60% of the street trees in New York. And that's a real, you know, a very uh, issue, an issue where it can be very, very destructive. And we've seen this with particular, you know, emerald ash borer, with Asian longhorn beetle, with woolly adelgid, with, with insect pests that come around. And because we have so much food for them, they really take off. Uh, so this is a, just a basic common sense. We need to have more diversity. But one of the things we've been looking at to try to evaluate trees for their ability to tolerate wet and dry soils, which is typical of urban environments and exacerbated by climate change, is looking for plants adaptations to limited water availability. And you can put it in two categories. One is avoidance. I don't want to basically like avoidance of water limitations or tolerance of water limitations. And in many cases, there's both interacting for trees. But for avoidance, you're basically uh, maximizing water acquisition, reducing water use, stormatal closure, reduced growth, and increased hydraulic conductivity. These are all avoidance mechanisms. Tolerance is where basically 
the plant is experiencing drought, but is able to osmotically adjust to keep the water in the cells, keep the turgor, so they can keep photosynthesizing even in the face of drought. So uh, some colleagues from Sweden and the UK uh, worked on that with me, and we'll talk about tolerance in a minute. This is a uh, uh, Tilletomentosa silver linden. It's a great tree, native of Eastern Europe, much more tolerant of drought than some of the other lindens we use. And you notice the white underside, the abaxial surface of the leaf, giving its common name. We look more carefully at this. You can see these trichomes on the abaxial surface, basically covering up a lot of the stomates. So they're basically creating a barrier for water loss that's giving the tree a little advantage in terms of keeping the water in the tree. I think that's a really neat picture, like an amoeba. And of course, this is the fall color of that tree. And so it's a great tree, uh, has a lot of these avoidance mechanisms that allow it to do well. Now the tolerance mechanisms, uh, we're looking at leaf turgor loss point can be a useful measure to determine which trees can do better given more and more drought stress as the season progresses. And so again, this was a work that uh, colleagues of mine from uh, UK and Sweden worked on for many years. I just show you a listing of 27 maple taxa. Um, the idea here is that we're looking at the, the negative turgor loss point. The more negative it is, the better it's able to hold water before it loses turgor. Okay? So the more negative, the better. And we did it in spring, which is the dark bar, and then summer, because trees naturally adapt over the season. And we're looking at some species that have quite, quite low turgor loss points. This one, Mon speciulanum, is from Turkey. Very small leaves, really tight. Uh, then, but this one, Granodentatum, is big tooth maple from the western part of the United States, which is hardly used here, but it, maybe it should be. Um, Acer spicatum really down. This is a tree that's native here in the gorges of Tremont. I remember walking around there and saying, what maple is this? I never see this on the street. And it's a mountain maple, Acer spicatum, and it's very, very intolerant of water loss, drought. So we can kind of look at these, and the more you get over Let's say three, you're basically looking at a tree that's more able to tolerate water loss over the coming time. So these are useful ways of evaluating trees, uh, doing this in a lab, taking samples, doing it in the lab, and then finding out the, uh, the issues there. So another thing we've done in terms of tree selection is look at develop hybrid oaks. Now the genera Quercus, is noted to be very, very tolerant. It's a very varied tolerant of stress. And we were looking at uh, within the white oak subgenera, looking of, to create trees that would be more tolerant of alkaline soils and drought and still have good tree form. So between 2004, 2006, we actually made crosses of uh, five maternal parents on the Cornell campus and we got pollen from all over the world and pollinated of the white oak group and pollinated these maternal parents at Cornell. And after several years, 2008, we uh, planted them out. Each individual genotype is in one of these plants. And then we started, well, if we, when some of them may have good qualities, we wanna be able to propagate them. So we did some work on propagation of oaks, which I'll show you here, basically using we cut back the trees, we etiolate the shoots that grow out in the dark. So cutting back is critical. You have to get to the really juvenile part of the stem to have this work. And then etiolation. And as the etiolated shoots are sized, we take a paintbrush and paint the back, the bottoms of those with uh, IBA, about 8,000 parts per million in ethanol. And then we shade the plants with this mesh trash can for a week while they green up. And we put a collar with soilless mix around these new shoots, which have been painted, and we let them grow up for about four or five months. And hopefully they're gonna root from the stump. Uh, and sometimes we're really lucky. 
So this is what happens after about four or five months. You see the roots coming from the base of those stems. You can take them off and the stump is still there to go again the next year. Uh, so this was great. We were wrote it up, very happy about this. First time really clonally propagating uh, oaks on a mass scale, but so if I want to get this to a nurseryman and, and start to produce these, every year I get about three rooted shoots. So do the math. Not very good from point of, but it's, it was a, definitely a first step forward. And we also evaluated them for these shoots for alkalinity tolerance, looking at the issues of chlorosis with a SPAD meter, you know, from really chlorotic to reasonably green leaves, which is a big issue with some oaks. And then these are those same trees out at Bluegrass Lane, uh, planted, of course, this is a low pH soil, so they all look pretty green here. And uh, we planted them all over. In fact, over 60 communities in New York State have some of these trees, which we are evaluating over time in different soils and taking SPAD readings. But this is a few that we think are really worthwhile that might be introduced first if we can solve a few more propagation issues. This is right outside of Men's Garden to the west side of Men's Garden. This is a gamble time was sort of gamble oak times burr oak mom times a overcup oak dad. And we get this really kind of unusual looking leaf, very unlike any of those parents. And it seems to be doing very well in high pH soil. It's pretty green. Other couple of ones that we're really interested in. This is a swamp white oak times English oak mom times a live oak times overcup oak dad. So it's a four way cross. And we also have a fastigiate form for this one. This is in front of Warren Hall. There's two in front of Warren. Uh, and then we have another one, uh, Swamp White Oak times Japanese White Oak Aliena, which is uh, doing very well. Look, notice the greenness of the leaf and the pH here is all over 7.6. So uh, it gives us some confidence that well, these are maybe good selections to introduce in the nursery. We had 305 individual genotypes when we did this. And we may get down to 10 trees that we think might be useful for uh, introducing. But the issue is getting enough. So instead of doing the propagation message I showed you, we started going into tissue culture. Now, no one has really done, successfully done tissue culture of oaks other than occasionally. So we have to massively produce these. We can get them to multiply. And when we're lucky, we can get them to root. Once we got there, then we can get them to the nurseries to trial and they'll do their own uh, trialing and, and then getting out to the community. So this is a long-term project. When you work with trees, you got to give it time. Sometimes you <laughs> I have five more months till I retire, but that's okay. I'll still be here doing the oaks. So, okay. So much for plant selection. Let's just talk about, quickly talk about limits of plant selection. It's great to have, you can have great trees, but if you have bad soil, it, it doesn't matter what kind of tree you have. So here we have two honey locusts, one on the left side growing next to an open volume of soil, one on the right side in a parking lot in a little pit, same species, and the growth is determined by the amount of soil. So this is the other aspect of site modification we started getting to. How much soil does a tree need? We worked on this in the early 1990s and came up with, I was gonna go through this, the formula, but I said that would take too long. But in general, two cubic feet for every square foot of crown projection of envisioned crown projection, not the one you put in the ground, but what you envision over 20, 30 years. So we can come up with that depending on the soil, depending where you are, depending on the rainfall, uh, all of that. But then you need to say, okay, I need to prepare that soil in order to have the size tree I'm interested in. Now this comes back to the original idea of green equity or greening our cities, because you can plant as many trees as you want, unless you're gonna get the canopy 
that's going to give you the benefits, it's basically worthless. So that's why planting, tree planting is very important, but we have to create the site that's going to allow these trees to get to their envisioned design size and give us the ecological benefits which we want them. And here's the place we recognize. There was when Man Library was being redone. You can see what happened to the Ag Quad then. And then we were asked, our class was asked to do a landscape in front of Man Library. And there was the, the dumpsters and the trucks and eventually they, they left. And so we did. We used a proce process called scoop and dump or amendment in place as opposed to bringing in soil. This is basically applying a layer of six to eight inches of compost to com com compact the soil on top, using a backhoe to dig down to about 18 inches, scooping it up and dropping it from about three feet. And we get a, a basically a veins of compost through the clods of compacted soil. We plant right into that and then mulch every year to replenish organic matter until we get to canopy closure where they're creating their own organic matter. So we've done this all over campus, probably different 20 different, every, all over the Ag Quad, back of Man Library, ILR Courtyard, Stocking, uh, lots of places. You don't know it, but we've done it. So this is what it looked like the, the year after we planted that front of Man Library, the first year, and a couple of years later, and a couple of years later. And so we've got the canopy closure where leaves are falling to the ground, creating more organic matter. So we don't have to go in and replenish organic matter, but we don't rake out anything. Everything stays in the bed. The idea of raking out the leaves is uh, a wrong practice. And that site won a sites award. That's right. It's, it's uh, one of the first 11 uh, sites or landscapes that were awarded a Sustainable Sites Initiative, which is like lead for landscapes. It's a national program. And this is one of those projects that got that uh, certification. So scoop and dump, we've, I'm not gonna show you the data, but poor soil resistance decreased, poor volume increased, improved bulk density, very important. Increased active carbon and nitrogen, improved soil structure, aggregate stability, improved plant growth and a long-term improvement over 20 years. Because we started looking at this, well, what happened when we first did it in 2001 till now? And so we have a lot of that data, which suggested that the soil actually gets better uh, over time. We did study of plants though, on some of our amended sites and on unamended sites, which are adjacent. We want to look at the plant growth aspects specifically, not just seeing that it, it looked good, but creating a more experimental design where we took uh, cores and we ran them into the soil unamended and in amended soil, we took the same cores and ran them into the soil. We had the soil in those cores and then we planted uh, ficus benjamina because it was in the winter time. We needed something that was going to grow in the winter greenhouse and we planted little plugs of ficus in those amended and unamended cores, grew them in a growth chamber. Again, this is a whole study of uh, data. This you can see the, uh, the compacted core. So we had the original plug roots and the roots that went off that only could be on the surface because the core was so compacted. So they went to the surface and they went down the sides of the core. Uh, so they made a run for it. But this was the original root system these are the compacted root system, and this is the amended soil root system of the same cores. And the root, roots are basically exploring every inch of that soil, getting to the whole area, going through the aggregates and so on. If we look at one piece of data, which is both density uh, increasing on the x-axis, and then we're looking at dry weight of shoots. Um, the amended is green, and the unamended is this pink. You can see the shoots weight is much greater when you have bulk density below 1.4 versus above 1.4. Now 1.4 is in the literature said that's the threshold for root penetration. But we know it's really a continuum, it's a regression. 
It's not like you get to 1.4 and things fall off the edge of the earth. If you can get your bulk density down in the kind of 0.8 to 1, you're much better than to think about, oh, I'm just 1.35, I'm okay. So you need to think about bulk density. It's a big driver of plant growth. Okay, got a few more minutes. So this was the other issue we really worked on was the uh, structural soil question. So we had compaction in the landscape due to construction and development, but what about purposeful compaction because of laying pavement? So here, this tree ball is gonna go into that hole and we're gonna say goodbye and good luck. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again in many years, but that doesn't happen. So sea structural soil was something we developed in the late nineties and it's been working ever since. So required compaction due to, you have to compact the subgrade, we call it, subgrade of soil before you lay pavement. Because if it's loose, uh, the pavement's gonna subside, it's gonna crack. So you have a load bearing surface that's purposely done before you lay pavement. And sometimes you actually even you know, reinforce it. And this hole, this little space here, um, what's that gonna be? What's that for? It's for a tree, okay? So we compacted this, we reinforced it, and we've left this little space for a tree to go in there. And the soil around that tree is impenetrable. So we're putting it in a pot and we're hoping it's gonna grow. So this is kind of the cross section of that. We compact the subgrade, which is all these hatch marks. We put a base course of gravel and then the pavement. And so we hope the tree's gonna get out, but very often it does not. But if it does get out, it might, you know, very surface, superficial roots. It's not getting much penetration at all. And the tree goes over or uh, we'll see what we did. So what we did this here is to develop a soil called CU structural soil, which is a, basically uh, a nod to the engineers and a nod to the trees, a compromise. These white uh, angular pieces represent gravel of one size, approximately one inch, two centimeters. And the, because we have one size, we have big pore space. We have a well-graded gravel. We use up all the pore space with smaller gravel. We're one size, pretty big gravel. And in between those pieces of gravel, we have soil and water and air. And the key is to have a gravel that locks into place, creates a rigid lattice. So you can land an airplane on it uh, and still have this place for roots and soil to go in. The soil in between those angular pieces is not compacted. The soil is not compacted. So the, the load is being borne by the gravel. This is the concept of structural soil. And that's what some we use in this area. You can see the angular pieces. We allow from three quarters of an inch to one and a half inches in size. We added, this is Jason Grabowski on my right, he's a graduate student now, full professor at Rutgers who did this work. And we're adding a clay loam soil with at least 20% clay to the structural soil. And we had to add on one more thing, which was a tackifier to the stone so that the soil would uh, stick and wouldn't, it wouldn't have hot spots and low, and low spots, wet and dry spots. So it had to be very uniform. And then we compacted, you can see roots just shooting through the structural soil, the rigid lattice shooting through this. So we thought we were getting somewhere. We did our uh, sidewalks to nowhere, uh, in Bluegrass Lane, where we uh, actually had trenches down three feet, lined with heavy mill plastic. We put structural soil or normal soil, compacted it to engineering specification, laid a sidewalk and put clonal trees in there to see how they would grow. And we knew what we were gonna do is take them, cut them down three years later, took the, the asphalt, the concrete off. There's the base course, the granular base course. And then we took the tree out of the ground in one piece using an air excavation tool, taking the whole root system out of the ground and not taking a, a sample. That's a structural soil root system. That's a normal soil root system. 
Now, just like we saw with the ficus, the roots are at the surface because they can't get in lower down. And so this, just like the ficus, this is one that came to the trench end and made a runner down the side. But we get this flat pancake roots. And that's of course what causes all the sidewalk heaving when people say it's the tree's fault. Yes, it's the tree's fault. This is quite, it's the way we plant trees that creates this. And uh, of course, this is a big issue. I mean, this litigious society, millions and millions of dollars are spent uh, reducing lawsuits because people trip and fall. So we looked at where tree roots are, tree roots are in the urban environment, and we see that they're right at the surface, you know, and they go into somebody's front yard, they're good. I mean, there's a narrow tree lawn, the trees don't have enough rooting space, so if they can make it into somebody's front lawn or some uh, other soil, the trees do well. And this is what we like to see as a term, as a basically a uh, detail where structural soil is between the building face and the tree pit, ordinary soil put into the tree hole so we can maximize water holding and we can have trees get more volume. 1997, first one was doing an Ithaca on Route 13. Uh, this is uh, MLK Street down near the commons. This is structural trees and structural soil after eight years. This is in Brooklyn, structural soil in the pits, but also between the pits, which you can't see on the top left. And after three years and after 10 years. Uh, 3,500 3, installed projects in the, using CU soil in 48 states, Canada, Ireland, GB, and Israel. Uh, also, I, I should say uh, Australia. Uh, but this happens to be uh, Miami, South Beach, with structural soil in palms. I mean, who to know? Once you get things out there, you don't know how people are going to use them. We have multiple brochures of giving a hands on how do you use this? But it gets out there. This is Sydney Olympic site, the plaza. Um, these are oriental plains in structural soil with irrigation because they have no rain there. So uh, it does very well. So again, a useful uh, use of structural soil is just a uh, solution to stormwater problems. This is another big project using porous asphalt with structural soil, allowing water to filter through, recharging rain, groundwater and allowing trees to be planted in those areas. So we often see these kind of massive flooding events, especially when there's more and more asphalt. This was Route 81 a few years ago. But the reason we could do this with structural soil compacted to engineering specifications, which is called proctor density, uh, we have total porosity less in structural soil than in normal soil because we have those big stones, which would expect less porosity. But the macro porosity, the big pores, 31% versus 2% of the macro porosity, which gives you drainage and infiltration rate greater than 24 inches or less than. 0.5 inches. So you can't just put porous pavement over compacted soil. It's just not going to go anywhere. It's going to go so slow. You need to have a reservoir to collect that water. So this was a site we did on uh, uh, Ithaca, where the sort of trail um, trailhead that people were parking in. So he said, well, why don't we try it here? So we put structural soil under this entire space, compacted it. We put porous and non-porous asphalt on top of it. If you're not familiar with that, that's porous asphalt, that's non-porous asphalt. And then we saw cut into it and planted uh, bare root trees in 2005. And that's the 2006 uh, spring. That's uh, 2009. 2012, so uh, they were really growing well. I mean, they were getting water, at least through the, at least both of them were doing well. But we started to notice in about 2012 that the trees in the non-porous, the traditional asphalt, were not as big as those in the porous asphalt. So non-porous 
they are a little smaller, porous asphalt. So we had to measure this. We had to decide what this was. It's getting late here. Um, we took our colleague uh, to use his ground penetrating radar to look at where the roots were. And each of these slices is the number of roots and the depth, okay? Pass of the ground penetrating radar. The trees would be in the middle, take six slices this way, six slices that way. You can see each of those red dots is a root and you can see where they are in the profile. That's of the non-porous, the traditional asphalt. And this is the porous asphalt. Much deeper, many more roots. And we think this is the reason why those trees are doing a whole lot better. And we look at tree growth. Since 2012, they were pretty much the same, but they started the ones in the non-porous asphalt are getting smaller. So it's important to know to get the water in the ground. That's an important piece. The last thing I'm just gonna talk about for a few minutes is transplanting, which is that four stage site assessment, plant selection, uh, site modification and transplanting. This is another issue, deals with diversity. Sometimes we wanna plant a certain tree, but it transplants very poorly. And we're looking at hydraulic conductance to measure the cavitation, the air bubbles that might be in the xylem tubes, which cause resistance to water flow. Got about one minute, left. one minute. Okay. Uh, basically, picture is small caliper, greater hydraulic conductance than uh, large caliper, and spring better conductance than fall. So a lot of you know uh, common wisdom is that small plants transplant better than transplant better than large ones. Yeah, there's a reason for it. At least this is one reason for it. We also looked at container trees. Uh, this is a problem we get very often with container grown trees. We do root pruning and we found that small caliper trees get greater conductance when we root prune than when we didn't. So I'm going really fast here. Last thing we did is transplanting with bare root using a U blade to go under the trees and get trees roots out of the ground. We dip the roots in hydrogel to keep them from drying out, put them in bags and uh, over 100 communities in New York and Pennsylvania use this method now to plant trees. And you can see it's about 25 pounds versus 300 pounds for BNB. Last two slides or so. To get all this information to the communities that need it, you need to, you need to engage them. So we had SWAT teams, student weekend arbiters teams for 10 years that went to the 60 communities, did tree inventories and master plans then presented it to the people, whether it's the elected people, people in DBW, arborists who were working with that community, we presented the data and suggestions for how they might go ahead. These are some of my guys. 10 years we did this. Okay. But we also know, need to know that there are amazing things we can do with trees in our cities. This is one of the most beautiful pictures. This happened to be Tokyo with ginkgos, all ginkgos there. And this is New York City, famous Paley Park, an oasis in the middle of downtown Manhattan. And my last slide. There's still things we don't understand. So there's a polonia growing out of a tree of my building. And that's me. <laughs> Long time ago. So any questions? I know I've kind of run, I've gone through a lot and I've run a little bit long, but there are questions, yeah. Hi, Dr. Bassett. Thank you so much for your uh, uh, presentation. I wanted to ask a little bit about the social benefits of trees in cities. You talk a lot about the economic benefits, <laughs> but what what is it like? What are the benefits and costs to a child growing up in a concrete jungle versus to a child growing up in a city that? Past trees. Well, I mean, this is what Don Rakow is working with in terms of uh, Nature RX. Uh, there are a lot of benefits. They're not as quantifiable as yet than the economic and environmental benefits. But I mean, having grown up in Brooklyn, New York, I mean, I, the trees, the parks were very you know, important to get out and play. Right. 
Yeah, and also to be cool when you're playing. Uh, so I know Mayor Bloomberg, when he was, his, there should be a park in New York City, no more than 10 minutes walk. That was the game, so have a park somewhere that people can get to within 10 minutes walk. Uh, I'm not sure that's all there, but that they're working toward that. So I think that um, there are lots of, you know, lots of, boy, I've seen lots more data in terms of benefits of uh, trees to people that are not just economic and environmental, but they're social, they're cognitive, they're, and that's what Don is going to talk to you about sometimes. <laughs> yeah, question, another question. I was wondering, is there a difference in cost and or durability or complication with the um, porous asphalt versus the yeah, so a lot of people say that porous asphalt would break apart, you know, and especially in the northern areas here. But we've found that, uh, in fact, the hospital uh, has all porous asphalt there. And that's been at least 15 years with no maintenance. I mean, they say you should vacuum clean it and all this stuff. Nobody does that. Um, <clears throat> and it's been very, very, the important thing is to put a, a reservoir under the porous asphalt so the water is getting moved down. If you have water sitting at the surface, it'll break up. So is that porous, whether it's just gravel or it's sea soil, if you're trying to grow trees in there, you need to get the water down from the surface. But the, and the cost of? The cost of using porous versus? How, uh, is it more expensive to make? Well, the main thing is the porous asphalt is regular asphalt without the fines, what the fine. And so it's basically much the same recipe, but the asphalt companies have to clean out a whole bay to make it. And so if it has to be cost effective amount, but it should, it's not really much more cost because it's just taking away one ingredient to make the, it's like caramel corn, the, the porous asphalt. Yeah. Let's see. So you talked a little bit about diversity and diseases. And I was wondering at what scales you think it's most appropriate to assess that diversity, specifically spatial scales. Yeah, so um, we've typically been looking at, we've done many different uh, research projects on looking at the makeup of city, street trees in cities. We did New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Massachusetts. We looked at all those states. And um, the scale, I mean, if you're looking at just a few blocks of one species, that's probably not a big effort. You have to think if some particular disease or insect comes down, and hits that two blocks, okay, you can deal with that. If, so we look at the whole city scale in terms of diversity, because when uh, the Dutch elm disease came in, all American elms were, some, some cities were 70%, and that arguably gave rise to the urban forestry movement because just this, this trees were gone and people really valued them. So we have tended to look at them at the community scale not as a block by block. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. But we also have another project where we said, so, well, people tend to want symmetry in some ways, and especially in Europe, but here too. So we have methods where you can have uh, visual similar, similarity with genetic diversity by choosing trees that look similar and our height to first branch is the same. And for, you know, students who haven't learned tree ID, they don't know what the tree, <laughs> you know, right? But uh, so people often don't know the difference between this tree and that tree if they look similar. So there are ways of putting things together to increase the genetic diversity, but have that similarity if that's wanted. So we have a couple of um, uh, questions in the chat. Mm -hmm. uh, do I have one oh, from Anya? Okay, I'm sorry, if it, the, for some reason they're not coming up, if you could please unmute and ask your question um, for Dr. Basuk. Thank you, yes. Uh, thank you so much for this presentation. It's just incredible to see all your work laid out like this. Um, and I was just wondering, are your SWAT teams still active? Are no, the no? SWAT teams are not still active. After 10 years, we decided that was enough. 60 communities, mostly in, Central New York, and we had a hard time finding more communities um, to do. Uh, and basically, we decided we gave people how to do it. It's all a website, community forestry website, which if you want to do it, how do you do it? But we decided after 10 years, 
we're not doing it anymore. Okay, and, and I've got two more. Spencer, you want to go? Sure. Yeah, thank you so much for the great talk. Really engaging. I was wondering, in addition to looking at street plantings, have you done any work to evaluate benefits of rooftop gardens or plantings in a city like New York? Something that I've mm -hmm. seen from my time living there. Mm -hmm. Well, rooftop gardens, though, I mean, putting green on a roof generally reduces the albedo, the reflectance, and reduces the urban heat island. In terms of creating a food source on urban trees, or could be a food source, or it could be just a sedum garden. Um, there are many, there are many benefits that are attached to that, but uh, there are also some limitations in terms of uh, nutrient-laden water going into the, the water pipes and into, especially nitrogen going into the sewers. Um, so there's a mixed bag of benefits putting a green roof on a roof. Most of the time it's an energy savings. Sometimes it's a stormwater savings, although you can do that with ballast without plants. You can have stormwater captured. But uh, without going into it in a big deal, there are a lot of different pros and cons of doing that. Thank you. OK, did I miss anybody in the in? Thanks, Spencer. <laughs> did I miss anybody in the chat? Um, Kate, Kate here. Um, I had a question about um, planting for the changing temperature profiles and, and the possibility of planting southern native species farther north. Is that something you have? Well, we have done that. Uh, in fact, in Ithaca and Cornell, we're at zone 5B, which is like um, minus 15 degrees minimum temperature. Downtown in Ithaca, we're 6A, which is minus 10 degrees. And so there are trees we grow down there that are probably not gonna grow well up here. So we have uh, Quercus mishoei, which is the swamp chestnut oak. We have Quercus lyrata, which is the overcup oak downtown in Ithaca, which are growing fine. And those are Southern species and they're growing perfectly well up here. So uh, we try these things. Sometimes we have Southern magnolia growing downtown, even Southern magnolia up here. Um, in certain you know, microclimate areas that we can push the envelope, which because some of these lists that this is this tree and this is, some of those are pretty general to observation. And sometimes we just need to try these things. And uh, so we are choosing some of these other uh, Southern trees and going into uh, at least downtown Africa. Okay, last one, Marianne McCloskey. Hi, yeah, I, I was interested when you said that you allowed the leaves to drop and stay around in the garden. Yeah. Now, in vegetable gardening, you, normally you're always told to take the, the pl dead plant matter away so that you don't um, increase the insects and any um, fungi that might be growing on the, on the plant. So is that not an issue with the trees then? Have you found that not, not an well, issue? Well, I... Um... No, it's not an issue with woody plants, which we're talking about here, and some perennial plants. We basically want that organic matter in the garden. And yes, it will have fungi and it'll have insects, but if less, they're not going to be really hurting the plants. I mean, they're just naturally occurring in the soil and they're breaking down the organic matter. And we want that to happen. So we don't worry about that in terms of infecting the plants. And vegetable plants, I mean, it's more a question of getting the you know, getting the soil warmed up and other issues, but uh, at least for woody plants, landscape beds, we definitely want those leaves in the beds. Okay, thank you. Great. Sure. Thank you very, very much, Dr. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.